The amount of research on coffee is about 200,000 studies. Do you know the amount of research on breast milk, mother's milk, and breastfeeding combined? It's 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 less than like 20,000, right? Yep. Yeah, less than 18,000. That's insane. That's atrocious. Atrocious. And so uh, a lot of that research, too, centers on topics that are not really oriented towards helping postpartum moms. Welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, talking wellness and weight loss for real life. We're here to clear up the myths, misinformation, bad science, and marketing to teach you how to eat and how to cheat. Are you ready? I'm having salad with a side of fries. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, here with you every week, and I'm excited to finally bring you this episode. So you may remember it was February 2020. We had an episode with Gally Dotan about pre and postnatal fitness. And at that time, I knew we had to talk about mother's milk and breast milk and breastfeeding. And today, I am honored to introduce you to our featured guest. She is the founder and CEO of Milk and Fire, a nursing activewear company on a mission to fund more data-driven research on breastfeeding and mother's milk to demystify mom's journeys. Having nursed two boys, she lived through the frustrating journey of unanswered questions and conflicting advice about breastfeeding. Milk and Fire brings together her personal experience along with her professional experience as a digital data and research executive with over 15 years of experience in analytics and insights. As a researcher, she was shocked by the absence of data on essential topics for nursing moms. She started Milk and Fire to use her analytics and research skills to help other women like herself. Living in Hoboken, New Jersey with her family and Sheepadoodle, she's also an active member of the New Jersey Female Founders Community, living her passion to mentor and help other female entrepreneurs. So not to mention, we've been friends for over 15 years, and I am honored to have her on this side of the microphone. So please help me welcome Marie Van Blericum. Yay. Hi, Jen. So Hi. happy to be here. <laughs> and we're actually doing this in person. Yes. I yes. Know. In New York City. Welcome. It's official. It is. It is. Are you ready? I am. Let's okay. do that. <laughs> Let's share the message. All right. So I, before we dig too deep, I want to tell our members what they're getting this week. So members, your recipe is for turkey burgers with slaw. It's another twofer, <laughs> right? Two recipes in one this week. So this is a great one to change up your weekly go-to meals. You know, maybe you're feeling like, you know, you need something new, but you don't want to throw your whole routine out of whack. This one does it. Plus, Marie is giving you all 15% off milk and fire athleisure for nursing moms. So maybe you're not nursing. It's okay, members. Feel free to share this with someone in your life who is. So that coupon code will be in your email this week. So to get the discount and the recipe, just be sure you're a member. Go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. For $10 a month, you get weekly recipes, a monthly article or tool, extra discounts from me and our partners and our guests, plus access to live Q&A sessions with me. A total deal, for real. When you take advantage of the full offerings, you're saving far more than that $10 cost. A no-brainer way to show yourself that your health is a priority. Plus, being a member shows your support for this podcast, this community, and above all, your health, right? This allows us to continue to bring you new episodes and experts every single week. So remember, you're going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries, or just click the link in the show notes. That's actually way easier. Once you're there, it's about three clicks, a little bit of typing, like your email and payment method, and then that's it. You're all set. You'll get the email on Friday with this week's recipe for the turkey burgers and slaw and 15% off milk and fire. All right, Marie, take a minute and walk us through, I know, <laughs> dance it out. Um, share your story with everybody and, I, you know, both your professional background and also sort of, you know, your personal story of nursing two boys and the drama of it all. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the the journey for this particular initiative started back in 2017. 
I was on maternity leave with my first son. And during the pregnancy, I felt completely informed and ready. Like down to the day, I knew what size of pineapple my child was. <laughs> um, and even, you know, for the labor and delivery, you have classes. And boom, baby comes completely unprepared for the postpartum stage. And I think that is an endemic here in the U.S. about being ill-informed about postpartum, postpartum health, and especially about breastfeeding. So, you know, me, I come from a background and a, a deep experience in data and analytics and research. So the first thing I did was try to actually find the research and the data on all these questions I was having at 2 a.m. Is this normal? Is this what my milk's supposed to do? Is this how it works? And I tried to look for the actual studies and research coming from academic institutes, and I I found almost nada. There was so little actual data and guidance to help me that I had to turn to other sources. And it was a hot mess, <laughs> a hot mess of conflicting data. I know exactly what that's like. Yes. Yeah. Moms with every sort of opinion, um, old wives tales, just crazy. And I saw a lot of my other mom friends going through the struggle. At the same time, too, I was also trying to figure out my new body and experience, and all of the nursing clothes were just awful. Super thin. You couldn't wear them when guests were over because you could see through them. <laughs> just what everybody wants. <laughs> Spandex, pilling. Um, and so I had that idea that I was like, look, let me use my experience to um, try to bring more data and information to empower moms on their nursing journey. And also, I want to make great products for myself, for my friends that are smart, technical, well-designed, aren't this terrible crisscross, big clips design um, that are similar to what we were wearing before we had babies. So that is Oh, you mean you want to be a human and a mom? Yeah. I, I know. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where kind of the idea came to both build this brand of high quality, high tech athletic nursing wear, as well as use it for the purpose of helping to fund more research on breastfeeding, breast milk, human milk, um, to help empower nursing moms. I love it so much. And, you know, you, you touched on this and that it's, the information is not there. And I think there are so many areas of wellness that go overlooked and undiscussed. And this is just one more example, right? And I know there's like more research on coffee than there is on breast milk. And like, what's crazy is that it's inherently part of every single human's life. Yes. So what is absolutely mind boggling is there 140 million women give birth around the world every year. And the amount of research on coffee is about 200,000 studies. Do you know the amount of research on breast milk, mother's milk and breastfeeding combined? It's, it's, it's less than like 20,000, right? Yep. Yeah, less than 18,000. That's insane. That's atrocious, atrocious. And so uh, a lot of that research, too, centers on topics that are not really oriented towards helping postpartum moms uh, on their journey. They're more oriented towards kind of early clinical settings. So, yeah, I think it's interesting, right? Like if we sort of take the somewhat analytical view of saying, all right, well, why is it that the research isn't here, right, on something that is so inherently human, <laughs> right? I mean, even when I look at the food industry, right, and compare it to that, like, the research always follows the money. And the money is in processed food, not in, yeah. you know, and how we can get more um, volume, if you will, right? Like, how do we get more food out of the same acreage of a farm. So like in taking that same logic, I have to think that applies here too. But tell us why, from all the research you've done, like why isn't anybody looking at this? Yeah, I, you know, I used research on research for why it was so <laughs> very low. meta. It's yeah, a very meta very conversation. Meta. <laughs> right. and, and they're really, for from what I can see, there's four main drivers. And the first one you nailed, uh, research follows profit. Um, since about two, 2015, more than 50% of research has been privately funded. 
And of the 50% of research um, or lower that is funded at universities or by governments, you when you talk to those professors, they still have a lot of pressure on them to do research that results in a profitable idea or something that can be patented and sold um, that can help that university as well to profit off of it. So the reality is... You can't sell mother's milk. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a profitable venture to do research on how to increase a woman's supply of milk versus increase the acreage yield of tomatoes. And right. so that is, that's a big one. Um, it is, it's something that the research that we do see on breast milk is oftentimes funded by formula companies to try to figure out how to replicate it, not answering those questions that keep mom uh, moms up at 2 a.m. or when they're struggling, especially during this pandemic at home by themselves trying to figure out what uh, the breastfeeding secret is with their baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second reason that it is much lower and more focused on topics that uh, are not as relevant to the journey is that controlled environments are much easier for research. So where we do see research, it's around the importance of breast milk with preterm babies, um, mm-hmm. and which which, which is a critical element. Um, it, it's more around. Um, well, that would be sorry to interrupt you, but that, like the whole thing with preterm babies is like they're in the hospital, exactly. which creates the controlled environment. Exactly, exactly. Got so it. when they're in the hospital, it's much easier to do this test control um, for uh, moms around milk. But once they get out, every single baby and mom's journey is different. They fit together like two keys. So it's very difficult because milk changes by temperature, whether the baby's sick, um, the stage the baby's in, whether they're going through a growth spurt or not. So it's very difficult and very expensive to do research to isolate factors like what increases supply. The third, and this is one that I am very passionate about as long as, as well as other women, is the complete lack of postpartum health uh, and support for women in the U.S. I mean, I mean, hold on, just like mic drop. Like there is, because we had this conversation with Gala. We were talking about like postpartum fitness, also even prenatal fitness. But it's like nobody talks about these things. Yeah, I mean, it is just crazy when you look at the numbers. Because again, I'm a numbers based person. So about half of women are still in pain weeks after birth. And yet they get one appointment with an OB who's not trained in a lot of postpartum topics like breastfeeding. And um, 52% of maternal deaths happen up to a year postpartum. But here is the part that is really just sad is two-thirds of those deaths are considered preventable causes. If they had had the right health support, the right screening, and the right um, uh, medical factors postpartum. And so this culture of lack of attention to postpartum health for women is also impacting breastfeeding and understanding around um, all of those questions to help mother's journey during that um, postpartum process. I mean, as I'm listening to you and like connecting the dots, I have to think that like, such a big piece of that is the lack of information and then feeling isolated and asking the question because it's not part of the conversation, not just with our doctor, but I think even, I don't know, maybe our friends group is different that like we did have these conversations, but I don't, I don't know if, you know, people feel like that's why they're Googling at 2 a.m., yeah. And like left to the interwebs to find answers. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that um, we do see in states that have higher rates of, of breastfeeding that that postpartum group support, that community, that going to the classes. And that's where Milk and Fire was born. I was at classes in Hoboken outside trying to figure out and seeing someone else just pop down and nurse and feeling comfortable to do that, too, and asking questions. Um, it's so critical for the success. And um, and not everyone has that, especially during the pandemic. Um, and then the fourth area that I've seen as a big driver for why there's so little research is, it's going to sound really familiar to the conversations about women in business, it's the gender disparity in science. Yeah. So women are underrepresented, and so issues that matter to women are underrepresented. Um, you know, about 36% of uh, articles published in medical journal- journals in 2015 to 2018 had females as a primary author. But what is crazy is that women actually get cited much less than men 
over time in their articles as well. So what happens is the topics that women try to advocate for get less recited, less additional attention and funding over time. And women are 20% more likely to drop out of that science and science publication uh, career path because of the lack of support for for them and their growing families over time. And so you're not seeing women as the ones directing where to do the research, directing where to do the articles, because we're lacking um, that representation of women and of women's questions in science. I mean... It's like, <laughs> there's so many things to address <laughs> so in this. I'm like, I don't so even know where layers. to start. And I guess, you know, we don't know where to start, but that's why we're having this conversation, right? Let's at least start by making it less taboo to talk about. Yeah. And answering the real questions rather than, you know, pointing everybody to the equivalent of like a TV dinner. Yeah. Right? I love that. <laughs> um TV dinners aren't healthy in any right. way. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about some of the biggest myths because I think, you know, it, it parallels the food world so much, right? So when we don't have, in the absence of facts and information and data, people's opinions run rampant or we end up being told all these things that may or may not actually be true, right? And so – yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest myths out there about mother's milk? Ooh, this is a good question because <laughs> part of what I have been doing as part of Milk and Fire, uh, because again, like my primary purpose is to be able to get better data for women. Uh, and what I do is I oftentimes will look at the academic research itself, not the news articles coming out of it, but the academic research, looking at their test design, uh, where there's actually conclusive data, um, significant differences, proper test design. And so I've looked at a lot of of these myths to see where do we actually have research to answer the question and where is it just abundance of half information that you see online and okay. one of the big ones is around diet and diet's ability to increase supply yes yeah so if anyone goes to their target or other store they'll see that in a huge area of all sorts of supply increasing foods I've looked across the bank of research the only food that has conclusive evidence behind it is oats mm -hmm. good old oats and so all, so basic yeah and so there is a lot of other supplements that people swear by but there is no research existing on them right now about whether they actually increase supply and so I think the idea that there is companies that are making lots of profits but not investing it into even research to validate the supply increases is such a shame but oats, yes lots of oats ladies lots of hydration the um, second one, which is uh, a fascinating study, is around supply changes through the day. So one thing you'll see in a lot of moms groups is the post of, I don't have enough supply at night, I need to supplement, or the baby is waking up throughout the night. Now, what this research found was that you do have enough supply at night uh, within a normal cycle situation. What happens is the milk gets more fatty. So the overall ounces is much less. It's different than in the morning where you, anyone who's nursed, you have a lot of ounces in the morning. It's very watery. The milk actually changes so that it's a heavier, fattier like milk denser. at night. Yep. To help the baby sustain more through the night to hopefully be able to sleep a little bit longer. So it's not that you don't have enough to eat at, to feed at night. It is more the milk composition has changed. And, and by the way, for all of us, right, fattier at night is supporting that sleep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, babies do wake up throughout the night. So just because the infant is waking up every few hours to nurse again does not mean you don't have enough supply. It means that that fatty milk has run through and they need more of a continuous supply similar to what they had in the womb and because they are growing so quickly. So um, yes, super frustrating. It's always amazing when you remember that moment when they have the first sleeping through the night, but um, <laughs> the milk does flex for that. Um, so it isn't necessarily a reason to supplement um, if that is something that you do not want to do. I, I think it's so interesting and I appreciate you saying that because I do hear like, you know, my baby's waking up, there must be something wrong. 
you know, and like it's natural, <laughs> you know, and like the quantity versus it's almost like a quantity quality mm-hmm. situation that like the quality of the milk is so much more dense because of the fat content that like it seems like less, but it's not really a problem. Um, I also think that there's like this myth of like it should be easy. Yes. Yes, that is because they don't tell you anything about it ahead of right. time, too. I mean, it is amazing that something that is as ancient as breast milk is, A, super difficult, and B, right. is so, it, it lacks so much information about it. But um, it's it's certainly not easy. And I think what has been a huge change over the last um, the last years is that now the lactation support in the hospitals um, is oftentimes mandatory coverage by insurance and is available. And that is because at least at that basic assumption that it's easy has been recognized to be false. Um, It is every baby and mother's relationship is different and it's not something that necessarily uh, comes easy or you just wake up knowing. It's um, something that has a lot of ways that can make it much easier if someone walks you through that, shows you how to adjust your latch, um, takes a, a look at you. Because remember, especially when you've just had a child, you've gone through a major medical event. You're not exactly yes. like at your top performance, going to nail it type of mindset that you have um, in life. And so getting that extra support is really important. Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like even the um, phrase lactation consultant has only been a thing in like the last few years. Yeah, and it's it's shocking that in medical school uh, for pediatricians and OBs, they usually only have about two to four hours of uh, training on lactation in total. Well, it's like nutrition. Yep. This yep. is just, right, we don't need to know these things. Yep. So the rise of the lactation um, specialist has been a really important factor. Um, we have seen rates increasing, especially in states that um, have stronger networks and have stronger coverage of uh, lactation consultants. But yes, it is, it's a specialty for a reason. Um, it's really important to take advantage of that if you can. Yeah. And so I think that just brings up the point of saying like, okay, your pediatrician, your OBGYN, may not be the best resources, you know, to get your questions answered. And so, you know, finding those people, whether it's a lactation expert or, um, you know, asking around to your friends or people, you know, that you do trust. Absolutely. Um, And I want to shift into also answering some of these questions and things that are not talked about enough. Um... But before we do that, I feel like we need to address, because I do think, and maybe this is part of the myth, maybe this is just a question, but, and I also don't want people to feel like this conversation is contributing to a pressure that you must breastfeed. If you're not breastfeeding, you're not a good mom or whatever it is. Like, there's research on every side of this, but like from your experience, like, what does everybody really need to understand? I think it everyone needs to understand it's a personal choice between you and your child and every single situation is different and one of the myths we were talking about a little bit earlier um when we were we were chatting is before recording before right? recording <laughs> when you're like oh we should have recorded that before right. recording <laughs> is uh is that moms while it's great to say I want to breastfeed for this amount of time um, it's actually better to take it day by day week by week and I think it's really important to support moms and give them the room to make the right choice for them and their baby in a breastfeeding and a formula journey on a day-to-day week-to-week basis so um, it really is something that if you if it's something that is working for you and your relationship with your baby and you want to continue long term then I want to make sure you have the resources and the understanding and not the stress and the frustration to do that. If it is something that is not the right fit for you and your baby and it's not something that's the right path for you, that is completely fine as well. Um, And, you know, formula has saved so many babies. It's like formulas come a long way. Like it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, Yeah, no, formula is definitely, formula was a 
really important invention because prior to that, if there um, was a issue with the mother's supply, if there um, was many, many other reasons as well, there was no alternative options. I think there, that old phrase, the wet nurses. and so Is that things, what that was? Yes, that's what that was. Um, and it, again, it was something that was for wealthy families, not for um, the full population that would need it. So formula has played a really important role in uh, maternal and uh, pediatric health over time. So, you know, whether it's breast milk, whether it's breast milk plus formula or whether it's formula, uh, make the decision that's best for you and your baby and best for your mental health as well, which is the priority over any of these other options. A thousand percent. And actually, this brings up what we were talking about also before we started recording about how like when we were growing up, There was such a movement toward formula. Probably, you know, as I connect the dots, part of that was a function of the research on formula. Part of that was probably a function of, I think, you know, it was like the working mom. And that was almost how you created freedom of choice for moms to be able to, like, go back to work. Yeah. I mean, I have found it so hard working myself now with when I was with a wonderful company that had a long maternity leave and like 20 different lactation rooms I cannot imagine how challenging it uh, would have been in the 80s to try to balance that when it was not a working environment that was supportive for pumping and nursing moms and I know many women now are still experiencing that where it is not a supportive environment for pumping and nursing moms and um, the 80s were interesting because we did see a significant dip and breastfeeding because there was um, so much information around uh, formula. Formula was seen to have added nutrients and elements that breast milk didn't have, and there was no research on breast milk to confirm or counter um, these claims. Um, But, you know, why this matters is a lot of our moms didn't breastfeed. Right, which adds to yeah. our confusion of we don't know what the hell is going on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I my mom um, breastfed all three of us in the 80s, and she was considered a big old hippie. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and she, I think she tried to pump for like a week back at work and found it so, so odd. And I think the thing was huge and all sorts of various. But what this means is I think there's a lot of grandmas that would love to support, but um, don't have that generation to generation that you do see in other countries where there's much higher rates of breastfeeding and much higher rates of intergenerational continuing of breastfeeding. So it is kind of an interesting aspect um, as we think about uh, our our future generations too and supporting them. Yeah. I, I mean, and to me, the key takeaway is like, let yourself off the hook for a second. Like, just like with everything else we talk about, like, of course, this is where we ended up given these, you know, situations and the data and the research slash lack of data and research. And so... That's why we're having the conversation now. Exactly. You know? um, so I want to get into um, kind of answering a lot of those burning questions that people are actually asking after a quick message from our partner for this episode, DNA Miracles. Because every child is a miracle, DNA Miracles provides the highest quality body and wellness products designed for babies, children, and expectant mothers. All products are gentle, easy to use, and 100% effective when used as directed. DNA Miracles partner with leading health professionals and scientists who follow the highest standards in ingredient selection to create the most effective skin, hair, and health solutions. As natural as possible, DNA Miracles is the best and safest option on the market for you and your little miracle. From expert pediatricians to real family testimonials, everyone has fallen in love with DNA Miracles. So as we're talking today about mother's milk, I figured it's appropriate to highlight DNA Miracle's Probiotics Extra. So both probiotics and prebiotics are necessary for a child's proper health develop proper health and development. So healthful bacteria and prebiotics are passed from mother to child through breast milk. In some instances, for example, uh, if an infant is formula fed or born through a cesarean section, it may be beneficial to supplement an infant with healthful proper amounts of beneficial components of breast milk. So there are also outside factors that may contribute to an imbalance of an infant's bacterial composition. So that's why DNA Miracle's Probiotics Extra provides your infant with scientifically formulated probiotic and prebiotic combination, as well as a healthy, safe serving of vitamin D. 
The combination of these three key components offer a synergistic effect and reinforce some of the beneficial effects of breast milk. So to try the DNA Miracles Probiotics Extra and get 10% off plus free shipping, text the word MIRACLES, M-I-R-A-C-L-E-S, to 844-947-4846. You'll receive the link and coupon code right to your phone. Again, simply text the word MIRACLES, plural with an S, M-I-R-A-C-L-E-S to 844-947-4846. This is a toll-free number. Standard text and data rates may apply. Okay. So back to you, Marie. I Some, love those. Pro- I, uh, yeah. I would say the research is definitely on the side of those probiotics. Yes. Together with, with milk as well, because even your, your breast milk does have some, but supplement DNA, it yeah. has a lot of research. It's great. And there's a lot around, um, this is not part of our conversation today, but there's a lot around <laughs> uh, vaginal birth versus C-section yes. birth and immune system. Yep. And gut. Yes. Absolutely. Well, our, our immune system is majority in the gut. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's where this came to be. Also, like if your baby has... Um, you know, is colicky or has a lot of issues, you know, with digestion or um, burping, you know, and some issues, for lack of a better word, right? Challenges. Yeah. These can be super helpful. As my second child did. And yes. They, <laughs> and they, they were, so. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of these other questions that people are asking. And we talked before about sort of nutrition and supply, right, with mm-hmm. oats. Um But I also think the other thing that comes up a lot is about like the transfer of nutrients from breast milk. So I'm also happy to chime in here, but you start and I'll. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so this is fascinating. And um, especially now in the, in the pandemic, so nutrients and antibodies. So when an infant is still being breastfed, um, they have what's called an open gut. And that means that the walls of their intestines uh, are what's the right way to describe it? Permeable. Yeah, permeable. Interesting (laughs) word. (laughs) And so um, the antibodies in the mother's milk uh, can actually go through the the walls and and circulate into the the body to help with um, preventing preventing disease. What is amazing is when the baby feeds, the receptors in the nipples actually um, have detectors to understand the current health state of the baby and what antibodies might need to be boosted um, as well as what composition might need to be changed. The composition does change when the baby is ill or fighting something off. Then there's two fascinating elements of breast milk in this process. Uh, one is around um, the digestive tract. So there is a molecule in mother's milk that will bind to invading bacteria and viruses and help flush those out of the system. I actually met a researcher in Finland who uh, the formula companies had paid her quite a bit of money to try to replicate this molecule. molecule. They hadn't yet, um, but what a fascinating aspect. Second, totally. Yeah. Secondly, uh, the antibodies responding to an infection or ones that um, the mom has built up as well are able to permeate the wall of the intestines and circulate to add additional protection. So we have seen uh, through numerous studies that uh, with COVID, that the antibodies from the mom, whether vaccinated or previously infected recently, um, are able to be passed on through breast milk and give vital protection to the babies, especially newborns or preemies um, f- who are more susceptible and more vulnerable population for COVID infections and, and outcomes. Yeah, it's just so interesting. And then because it, I feel like the COVID piece of it and the antibodies – also then begs the question of like, well, how much is of what I'm eating is impacting, you know, the baby? And if I know, so you had mm-hmm. one of your kids had some significant food allergies and you had to alter your nutrition <laughs> to make that happen. Now, this doesn't mean it's the case for everybody, yeah. but will you share with everybody? Yeah. So 
when you um, eat different things as a nursing mom, um, elements of those are passed on through the breast milk. It's supposed to be to help uh, grow the digestive system, to be able to sample different nutrients. Um, it usually works quite well for allergies because you know, moms who eat quite a bit of peanut butter, also when they're pregnant, this also occurs. Um, or when they're nursing, we see lower rates of allergies. Unfortunately for my second, um, he has had a wheat allergy since birth. And so when I was um, eating, Eating wheat, he would then have a digestive reaction because those proteins were passed through and his immune system essentially reacted to them like they were viruses or bacteria. Um, so th- that that was um, a, a journey of removing things and putting them back in. Um, there is a lot of discussion around soy and dairy allergies. Um, I would just uh, tell moms who are thinking that they need to remove a lot of things from their diets to really consult a lactation consultant or try different ones in a really gentle way because it can add a lot of strain to to moms um, to try to not only be through the sleepless nights and care for a young child but also start to do a elimination diet yeah and I think and you know and this just brings up to like um generally for mom right you don't necessarily need a special plan eating well for you is eating well for baby yeah you know and um I mean you talked about it before like you don't need extra supplements and extra things just because you're breastfeeding. You want to make sure, you know, you're getting the quality fat versus like it, it's really all the same because we're all human. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everything we talk about here all the time is for human health. Yeah. And so that yeah, means absolutely. it's good for baby's health. Yeah. Just keep on taking those prenatal vitamins. You know, those have a yep. lot of great vitamins in it and hydrate and eat, eat well rounded meals. I think it's just the most critical thing for for supply outcomes um, and you will see like when hydration drops when you're traveling and not getting enough calories that's when you're you'll see supply changes as well yeah and it, that actually brings up an interesting piece because I think um I hear often and it's generally before people have babies but one thing that does come up is oh you burn so many calories when breastfeeding right and it, I just sort of want to say like, yeah, it can be really helpful, but also that doesn't mean you need to eat a ton extra. It's really pay attention to, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Like still just continuing to pay attention to your body's own signals. Yeah. So you do burn about an extra 650 to 750 calories a day, which is why I make an athletic wear line because right. I think nursing moms are athletes. A and thousand percent. Great clothes. However, the myth around whether women gain or lose weight uh, um, during breastfeeding is actually very different for each woman. We don't see any consistent because for some women, I think their body goes more into a protection mode and they might actually gain or uh, hold on to or gain. And for other women, it is... Um, um, the opposite. So there is unfortunately not one outcome that's guaranteed. Yeah. However, I will say like we do know from the data that um, doing baby led eating and feeding. Um, so feeding when the baby's hungry and letting the baby drive the schedule is really effective for babies. It's actually great for moms too. So <laughs> as Jen said, <laughs> that listening to your body um, and following your body for when you feel like you're hungry, when you need more nutrients and and, and letting your, your body lead the way versus feeling like you have to be on some sort of restrictive or exact schedule. Um, I personally loved keeping a water and snack basket next to that rocking chair because I was in there all the time <laughs> during those first 12 weeks. Um, but do what works for you. And definitely, you know, if you do have a partner, significant other, um, parent or helper around, like put them to use to also cook some great meals for you. We, we get that from some, some other cultures have that built Mm -hmm. into the postpartum period and I would say as much as you can with your tribe try to replicate that I love that advice pro tips (laughs) pro tips (laughs) um I think another one and this goes back to something we were talking about before about supply right and this idea of nighttime versus daytime like I hate the word normal but what is typical or what can someone expect So babies do tend to eat between a range of 32 to 36 ounces a day, and there is a wide, wide error range behind that average. So the 
um, it really, again, is like that baby led um, just because you're you're they're crying at the end or they're pulling off like it's very hard to judge how much is actually coming out there's not like you know after kind of the first few weeks there's not a lot of physical signs so um, I would say the best way to do it is is baby led eating Um, there are some uh, approaches like power pumping (laughs) we won't get into here that can help increase supply Um, but as long as you're not supplementing to a point to where it's going to start to send to your body signal to decrease supply because the baby's not pulling that much supply out. Um, it, it should hopefully balance. But in some situations, some women's bodies, some hormone changes, it doesn't always work out. So um, always talk with your nutrition or your pediatrician about whether their weight great gain is on track, if it's following the curve, whether it's in the proper um, margin of, um, of movement, because sometimes babies will go below or above in certain ranges um, to figure out what's best for you. Awesome. And I think that actually brings up the question too of like storage and shelf life, right? Especially if you're pumping to then feed, right? Like how long does it last? I know like I know from traveling with you that like it can last (laughs) and ice packs are your friend, but I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily know. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're quizzing me on all this good this good <laughs> stuff. So the guidelines that we've seen is four hours at room temperature. So if you're pumping it and, and setting it out four days in the fridge, just make sure it's kind of in the back of the fridge. Or if you're traveling, you have a short business trip and you worry about your milk freezing and thawing. If it's less than four days, then you can, instead of freezing it, you can use the hotel fridge. And then six months frozen. Uh, but you can go up to 12 months if it's in a deep freezer. Most Most milk banks will accept up to seven months. Um, So I think kind of six to seven months is a really safe range for being more conservative. Uh, When you do thought, you do need to use it within about 24 hours because that milk um, has potential then to regrow bacteria because it's already gone through the likely sitting out four days, being frozen, et cetera. Got it. And I'm going to come back to the bank thing in a second. Um, (laughs) I want to ask a question um and this might be a dumb question but I think I'm not the only one who's ever had this thought no dumb questions so there's a lot of research there is research around skin to skin contact oh absolutely right and so there's a big piece of breastfeeding that's skin to skin which if you're pumping and then using a bottle you're not necessarily getting that skin to skin during feeding like, are there implications to that? Does it matter? So the skin-to-skin research is really around at birth um, and the importance of um, getting that skin-to-skin contact within the first hour for uh, – there, there's a number of um, – body systems that are triggered for a newborn, a a lot of things that kick into place like a domino effect for that initial skin to skin. So that's why, especially for C-sections, they've adapted a lot of the practices over the last few years to try to make sure to get that skin to skin right away versus whisking the baby away for baths, et cetera. Um, When it, then it comes past that period when you're talking about the skin to skin for pumping versus uh, direct nursing, it's, it's not as much of a big deal. And, you know, I would, all the pumping moms that I've talked to, and that is, that's a tough route as well, too. It is so tough to pump, wash those parts, then feed. It's like three times the amount of time. They're still getting the same amount of, of bonding, you know, holding them close, um, oftentimes doing skin to skin while feeding. Same for formula as well, too. So I think the, that Take baby, the pressure. Yeah. Off. You know, and we see dads do that a lot, too. Yep. Um, so really that skin to skin research is and pressure is very much about the first hour after birth. After that, the skin to skin just triggers all sorts of nice hormones like a hug, but it doesn't necessarily have to be linked to direct feeding. Perfect. Everybody relax. Yeah, <laughs> everyone relax. Everybody relax. Just relax. Relax. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another one that comes up uh, that I always remind people is um, because I think a lot of the instruction sometimes also like to help the baby latch or whatever is like you feel like you're suffocating this baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I remember um, having a conversation with somebody and they were like, I was so relieved when 
I don't, I can't remember if it was like the midwife or the doula or whatever was like, don't worry, like baby will always choose air. Like that is human (laughs) instinct. Baby will always choose air. You are not going to suffocate trying to feed your kid. <laughs> yeah. So the flare of the nostrils um, is actually part of the design of, of babies, the way that their faces are built as well to help with that facilitation of the air. But yeah, they will not. They will not. And a big part of it too is you're, you're not supposed to just like hold the head in place. You're supposed to like press through the upper back. Um, so there, there is all sorts of mechanics um, where uh, when you're nursing and you're awake and attentive, it's you're not going to have any issues. I think where the danger comes is when, when moms are nursing on couches and other areas and fall asleep. And so that's something to be really conscious of, but, um, not, not nursing. You're, you're good, but you do have to, they really have to get in there. They have to have a good wide latch. Um, and then I think another question that comes up all the time is like, and again, I'm not a big should person, but like the length of time. And you mentioned it before that this is very individual, but Based on the data, what are the recommendations for how long to be breastfeeding or pumping and using breast milk? Yeah, so I remember when my oldest was about six months old, I calculated, because he was a very slow nurser, he would take about 50 minutes for each nursing session. And when they're born, the number of nursing sessions are usually about 10 to 12 is average. So I calculated it was something like I spent 18, 1,800 hours nursing. This was a course used for a debate with my husband to be like, I have spent 1,800 hours nursing. You're going to go do these things. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so there is kind of guidelines of you know 10 to 12 times when they're first born, but it really can ta- make a big difference. My second was 20 minutes. Um, so I think anywhere between 50, uh, 15 and uh, 50 is is normal, um, and they get more efficient. Also depends if they have underlying um, things like tongue ties can make it more difficult and long. If you're concerned, I would consult a lactation consultant um, to take a live look. But it's really about do they pop off at the end with um, kind of do they pop off themselves at the end and do they have that satisfied kind of sleepy look to them? That's a good indicator if they've gotten enough. But if they do start crying 20 minutes later after that and they're a newborn, that might be normal. And then age wise, right, like life I've heard a lot of recommendations around six months and then potentially using some breast milk as you're adding in solid foods for baby but what are the recommendations there and it's so individual yeah really no recommendation there it's really an individual choice um who does recommend up to two years especially for countries that struggle with uh, malnutrition and and balance because breast milk can be such a great um, a great nutritional source, but I mean that that's a long time for many people. Um, so I think it's really a choice of when that relationship is no longer uh, feeling right for you and the baby. So again, if that is one week, that's great. If that is two years, that is fantastic as well. And it really just is what fits with you and the baby and your your life and where they're at. Um, Long term breastfeeding could be wonderful as far as being able to. Uh, um, uh, soothe tantrums to balance out. Um, usually when they start to eat, they're eating just very little things. It's not a full nutritional and fat heavy diet. Um, so it, there's a lot of benefits for extended breastfeeding, um, but it isn't, it isn't um, something that is mandated or absolutely recommended. It's more what's recommended again is the mental health of you <laughs> as a mom and what fits best with your life and with you and the baby. Or a hands toddler down. at that yeah. point. Right. It's or, young, point or a young child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we touched on this before, but I just think, you know, managing expectations, like, it's not easy. It's not necessarily simple. There can be complications and challenges and, you know, the expectation that it should just happen, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we've addressed, like, you can let yourself off the hook and there are resources. Yeah, it's yeah. your and your baby's journey. No one else's. So I just want to yeah. make sure you have the resources to make it a more pleasant and less stressful journey and have data to ensure that you're not doing anything that makes it more stressful or um, or you have to, to stop sooner than you wished. Cool. Yeah, so let's go back because you mentioned um, banks before. And so um, talk to us about donating breast milk accessing donated breast milk like 
I know you donated. Mm -hmm. I know you also still have some in your freezer. (laughs) I'm totally outing you. (laughs) Yeah. But I know that the general public doesn't necessarily know about these resources or, you know, this way of potentially helping other moms. Absolutely. So I think Mother's Milk Bank banks are one of those things that you file under you have no idea they exist until you're in the unfortunate situation to have a child in uh, a NICU and this is something that you know I also had no idea and um, what my own personal journey is I as mentioned I found out that my youngest son had a pretty severe wheat allergy and that was by the time we finally got that confirmed that was about nine weeks in and in the beginning, I had quite an oversupply, and I would add additional pumping sessions. So I had quite a bank of milk. And um, there is a national shortage with mother's milk and in milk banks. And why is this so important? It's not just food for preemies, it's medicine. So a lot of mothers of preemie babies are not able to pump or to nurse because oftentimes, you know, a child born at 20 eight weeks at 32 weeks was likely born in a situation where um, it was an emergency situation. The mother might not be available to nurse. She might not um, be in a health situation where she can. She might not wish to because of everything else going on. Um, And so it is really critical, though, because one in 10 preterm babies uh, experience a very debilitating disease called uh, necrotizing endocrolitis, or NEC. And being able to have access and um, eat breast milk uh, lowers the risk of that by 80%. So again, it's not just food, it is medicine, and it's really critical for preterm babies. Now, at the beginning of COVID, because a lot of moms were at home and had extra milk, the milk banks were seeing a surge. There's now a massive shortage, meaning there are preterm babies that are not able to access donated milk that's been properly tested, pasteurized, treated, combined, um, and handled for them to be able to reduce the risk of that um, very uh, serious condition. And so I think for me, I fell into it. I actually had other moms tell me not to do it because it does require some pre-work. They're like, sell it on Facebook. <laughs> Again, you can't sell milk. Um, but <laughs> it, I, I appreciate <laughs> the entrepreneurial spirit. Yes, I do appreciate yeah. the scrappy spirit. Um, but so every ounce of breast milk donated is three meals for preterm babies. I mean, that's that's amazing. That's insane. That's amazing. And there is a little bit of work you have to do. There's a number of really wonderful milk banks. Um, you usually do kind of an intake questionnaire. They ask you some lifestyle questions, ensure that the milk was pumped and stored properly. And then you do have to do a blood test, um, blood test within the last 30 days um, to confirm that you are um, a qualified donor. Because we're talking about preterm NICU babies. Um, but yeah, it's, they're wonderful people. It was great. I got a, a pack up, I think it was 160 ounces and, and ship that off. And, uh, I think that for me, knowing that that helps so many babies is really important. But like I said, they're having a national shortage right now. It's a really, um, a really terrible situation with the shortage. So please, if you have extra milk or you know those that do, it's well worth going through the process, um, to be able to donate it. Is it only preterm babies who can access milk from banks? So they do it through a network of hospital networks. They collect the milk, they mix it, pasteurize it, test it um, so that they know it's really well balanced and then redistribute it to NICUs. There is some possibilities to access the um, milk banks through, and especially at the beginning of COVID when there was an extra abundance of donated milk, um, and through going through the sites and seeing different milk banks have different qualifying uh, capabilities. But I think as well, especially now, a lot of moms are who are positive for COVID in the hospital are separated from their babies, and that is also causing a lot of the issues and the shortages for having enough mother's milk now for for preterm babies. So more important now than ever, especially especially if you have been vaccinated or um, have um, recently had COVID, to donate to make sure that those babies are also protected with antibodies against the pandemic. Amazing. So. And we've spent a lot of time talking about research and lack of research and all those things. And I know that's a big mission of what you guys are doing with Milk and Fire. So tell everybody, you know, we've mentioned like moms are athletes for breastfeeding. (laughs) This is um, 
athleisure or fitness apparel, I suppose, right, that's accommodating for nursing moms? Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to create a line that was high quality fabrics, high tech, um, smart design that doesn't have the you know, crisscross tops and big clips that scream nursing mom that are really the high quality um, products that nursing moms deserve because like I said, they are athletes <laughs> burning, yeah. burning many calories a day. Um, you know, I took a lot of my own personal favorite designs, took a lot of um, inspiration from other Hoboken moms of what they felt comfortable and confident in and design products around the postpartum changing body, but also with hidden nursing elements. Um, a lot of the fabrics are antimicrobial and antibacterial um, to really help support kind of a that environment uh, when you're when you're nursing and working out or just going about your life. So yeah, I just wanted high quality, soft, smart products and um, wanted to use the sales of those towards good. Yeah. So P.S. Like I saw some of those designs before they went into yes, production. Yes, Jen was highly recommend early. them. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then also you're donating a portion to fund research. Exactly. Yeah. So every sale, a portion of every sale goes towards funding more research to demystify breastfeeding. Um, but yeah, I think I should have brought you. We have these cozy sweaters that convert to nursing covers. So perfect for right now where it's freezing. Oh my god. Well, I'm gonna come over one day. You know, like. We can do these things now in moderation. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So it's time for our short list of rapid fire off topic questions. You ready? Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the best thing you've done for your health this week? What's the naughtiest thing you've done related to your health this week? Oh, so I've gotten really into atomic habits lately. Yes. So I James Clear, everybody. Yeah. So I decided instead of trying to go like all out with the exercise and food, I've been trying to just do like five minute classes and um, two meal healthy meals a day, and that's been that's been really effective. Um, the worst thing this week has definitely been the meals that weren't on that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I might maybe we'll do an episode. All inspired by James Clear. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's a really a great book. concept. Yeah, really amazing. All right, if you weren't a marketing maven and the founder of Milk and Fire, what would you do? I I feel like I've I've found my, <laughs> found my place. I mean, I'm really passionate about helping other female founders. So you know, I I wish I could spend even more of my day just working with with the entrepreneurial community and just helping where I can with my with my marketing experience. Knowing you, you'd be like. A tech investor. Oh, yeah. Like you'd like fun. find these startups and invest yeah. in them and yes. grow them. And yeah. Favorite book on any topic other than your area of expertise? And not James Clear Atomic Habits because we already talked about that. Ooh, I don't know if this counts, but I think one of my favorite books is Expecting Better by Emily Oyster. She does a similar approach of actually looking at data on key topics and reporting out where there actually is conclusions that can be made. And so I think she's she's a really inspiration for, for all of us. And I just love her books, too. Okay, I'm adding that one to my list. If you could cure one ailment, disease, or sickness, what would it be? Cancer. That's a big one. Always. 100%. Yep. If you were a superhero, what would be your superpower? I always thought it would be amazing to be able to like time travel. Yes. <laughs> and and like I'm just, yeah, would be fascinated about to go to places to see why people made the decisions they made. <laughs> I like that one. What's your biggest pet peeve? I think people posting recommendations to other people who aren't actually backed by any sort of data research um, that might have a negative impact on on that person preach (laughs) preach okay uh finally in your opinion what's the next frontier in wellness Oh, so I'm fascinated by DNA and all the DNA research going on. Um, So I really do think there's a lot in the area of epigenetics. So Mm -hmm. different environmental factors, different even bacteria triggering things within our our bodies that might have been latent um, and we're not aware of there. So I think that area of um, of wellness is fascinating. Can I do a second one? Yeah. I am also super passionate about the rise in women's wellness. So only two companies on the stock exchange are female health companies. Insane. Insane on the New York Stock Exchange. And so I think, however, this whole rise of our generation of women um, going into 
perimenopause, <laughs> menopause, new stages of life, you know, having kids and demanding better mm-hmm. data. Um, I think there's a big movement coming there. And I think it's going to be finally a point where those that are brave and go after helping to serve those opportunities and solve those problems are going to are going to benefit greatly. And I'm really excited to see what emerges there. Absolutely. Well, so Thank you again for being here. I Thank love you seeing for you me. and also <laughs> to share milk and fire with everybody. Um, tell everyone how to connect with you and snag some milk and fire pieces. Yeah, absolutely. So our website, uh, milkandfire.com. Uh, and don't forget your your code if you're a member with Jen. But I would love to hear from you. There's, um, a, there's contact information on there. But please do, if you have a topic that you want us to put funding towards in relation to mother's milk and uh, lactation and breastfeeding, please do let me know because we are planning what our next phases of research should be. Amazing. And we'll put links in the show notes for everybody too for Instagram and um, the website and all that good stuff. All right. Are you ready for our nutrition nugget? Yeah. Let's do it. This week, we're talking about green juice. So this used to be a really big thing when all the juice boutiques, right? Like all the yes. juice stores were <laughs> popping up all over. And it sort of died down. And then it resurfaced again. So I figured if a couple of people are asking, more of you probably are. So somebody, the reason why this started, somebody emailed me with a photo of a green juice and said, pick this up at Costco today. Didn't know they sell these. So I, was, I replied, I didn't know that either. <laughs> you know, like, who knew Costco was on the green juice bandwagon? Anyway, I... So in that reply, I said, you know, they can be great on occasion, but I'm generally not the biggest fan of juices. And then it started this whole back and forth, right? So in general, I'm a fan of chewing my food, right? <laughs> so, And here's the deal. And we've talked about this before with juices, and it, it applies even with juices made out of vegetables and fruit, right? But vegetables or sorry, juices remove all the fiber, right? When we talk about fruits and vegetables, we talk about them as the carbs that our bodies need and providing critically important fiber for our bodies and our gut health. So juices concentrate all the sugar, eliminate all the fiber. So what we're left with is essentially a sugary liquid that will likely spike our blood sugar and put us into a fat storage mode, which generally is the opposite of what we're looking for, you know, when we're focusing on making quality choices for our health. So when you're looking at the label, right, of any green juice, you can see it. So I have photos here from the ones that were sent to me from the ones from Costco. So it says green juice with probiotics, cold pressed juice, It says on the front of the package, apple, cucumber, celery, lemon, spinach, ginger, kale, parsley, and cultures. So then when we flip it over, there are six servings per container. Like, that is massive, (laughs) but okay. So it says a serving size was a cup. Um... And when we look at, right, when we're looking at vegetables and fruit, we're looking to be getting our fiber. This juice has a total carb count of 17, zero grams of fiber, 15 grams of sugar, zero grams of added sugar, one gram of protein, um, zero grams of fat, 70 calories. So essentially, right, when we talk about reading labels, we look at net carbs. So net carbs is total carbohydrates minus fiber, minus sugar alcohols and glycerin if they're listed. So they're not listed here. 17 minus zero grams of fiber is 17. And we actually want our net carbs of food choices to be single digits. So 17 is not a single digit number, right? (laughs) Which means this is likely to spike our blood sugar. And it's not giving us any fiber. With only one gram of protein, it's essentially no protein. Right. So when we look at what boxes we're able to check in our nutrition of the things that we're getting. No green juice. (laughs) No green juice. I mean, it's just not checking anything off, you know, from the things that we're looking for. And I can hear some of you going, well, 
you know, mine's not from Costco, right? (laughs) So here's your challenge. Read the label. Send me a photo of it. Let's look at it together because I'm super fascinated by, you know, comparing and looking at all the different ones. But what we really are seeing is that we're not getting what we're looking for from fruits and vegetables. Now, having said that, sure, we can get vitamins and minerals from the fruits and vegetables in a green juice. And that's actually why I think everybody jumped onto the bandwagon and and the big thing around pressed juices, right? So when you cold press uh, your juice, it does retain more of the vitamins and enzymes and minerals and antioxidants that are in the fruits and vegetables as compared to regular juice. But, you know, I suppose on the spectrum, right, that makes it a bit healthier than traditional juicing. But it's still not giving us what we're looking for, right? It's not giving us quality nutrition that's sustained fuel and satiation that would happen if we ate the actual fruits and vegetables. So, Quick note, because this also comes up in the context of cleanses and detoxes that are advertised to us. So we have to remember, right, our body was designed to do the work of digestion, right? We actually need the fiber to clean out our GI tract and help with that elimination to escort all the toxins out of our body. So when you're doing, you know, a cleanse like a juice cleanse, the number on the scale might go down, but really by body composition, you're losing mostly water, maybe some muscle, right? And if it's for an extended period of time, you could actually be losing bone as well. So the follow-up question is, do I just drink juice with pulp, (laughs) right? (laughs) And, you know, kind of, sort of, right? So Pulp, when pulp is, it's like they do the juice and then they sort of add the pulp back in. In comparing the labels of juices with pulp compared to juices without, it's actually not making a difference, right? We can see that when we look at the fiber content. It still tends to say zero grams of fiber. So the way I think of it is like a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum is a juice. The other end of the spectrum is eating a whole food. Smoothies are somewhere in the middle-ish right? (laughs) And then your juice with fiber is closer to juice than smoothie, but on that side of the spectrum. So my recommendation, save your money, buy the food, (laughs) right? Green juices tend to be pretty expensive, generally more expensive than if you actually just bought the fruits and vegetables themselves. Um, Plus, it's infinitely better for our health to eat the foods. Having said that, on occasion, does a veggie juice with a little bit of fruit sometimes sound really good? Yeah. So, you know, just keep it in balance, enjoy it on occasion, and focus on eating 8 to 12 servings of vegetables a day, one to two fruits, and you'll be good. Save your money on the green juice. (laughs) Marie, any thoughts? Questions? I mean, I'm going to save my pulpy juice for my mimosas. So, (laughs) (laughs) Amen to that. Yeah. I think that's shocking, though, the lack of you know, you would think green is a semiotic cue for healthy, but it is. Nope. Well, that's what the marketing is telling yep. us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> totally. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you. This is fun. I love having you. We'll have to do it again. As always, everybody, I'm your host, Jen Trepic. Connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, wherever, social media, all the same handle at Jen Trepic, J E N N T R E P E C K. Our website is a salad with a side of fries.com. So anywhere, send us a message, your key takeaways, your questions, any ideas, want to hear from you more than anything. This is also the easiest way to learn more about working with me. Of course, if you're not already a member, join our membership program by going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. This shows your support for this podcast, this community, and above all, your health. This week, you're getting the recipe for turkey burgers with slaw and 15% off milk and fire athleisure for nursing moms. So until next week, everybody, remember, there's so much about health, especially women's health, that's not discussed. So speak up, right? Have the conversation with people in your life so we can demystify mother's milk. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. Congratulations for making yourself and your health a priority. 
Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to click subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform, share us with a friend, and we'll be back next week. Always remember, you deserve it and you are worth it. Happy healthy.